This is about an Afghan farmer and his family who is living on the edge of starvation. Like many people in Afghanistan, his only income that he earns does come from crops and he borrows $2,000 from a local trafficker so that he can plant his next uh, harvest for the crops. And of course he chooses poppy because poppy is very resistant both to disease and drought and poppy is by far the most prof profitable crop that you can grow in this part of the world and where there's a huge demand. Um, and he does that, uh, uh, he chooses poppy that not only he can support his family but also pay back the debt and the interest that's being charged on. And so shortly before the harvest, a government eradication team comes with an, I guess, equally good intention, you can say, and eradicates his uh, entire crop in one go, leaving the farmer not only with nothing, but also with a burden of debt that he owes to the local strongman. And so what, what does he do? He flees. Um, his family and he flees the region where he is but he's found and caught and by the way this is a true story that was reported in the news he's caught is put in, f in front of a local tribal council that rules that the farmer must compensate the local strongman and given that he has no money uh, it is being ruled that he has to compensate the local strongman with his own daughter a nine year old girl that gets married off to the trafficker and I'm sure all of you have heard about the term poppy brides um, this is only one story, but I think it, it shows what the impact of current policies on the development agenda is. And I'd like to quote from a UNODC and World Bank report that writes about the strategy of eradication, I quote, is felt most by the weakest and the poorest actors involved in the opium economy, poor rural households who lack political support, are unable to pay bribes, and cannot otherwise protect themselves. Before 1979, Afghanistan produced small amounts of opium for local consumption, uh, traditional opium smoking, which is less harmful than injecting heroin by great margin, and uh, maybe some small regional trade, but very small. Then, uh, after the uh, war started, uh, cultivation was increased and was used as a means for financing the war against the Soviet Union. And then later, it also was used for financing civil war. So uh, I, I, I think it, it clearly made things worse. But how it started was in this kind of uh, situation where without governance, without a functioning uh, state that can control the countryside, and also conflict and displacement. And uh, that's what's led to Afghanistan's, that's the background. What you do about it now is a much more complicated uh, situation, but I think we should be clear, uh, uh, and I think other countries often are that in the, in the ungoverned spaces where there's no uh, alternatives in terms of livelihoods or, and where the government is weak and there are strong men, let's say, who benefit from the cultivation, uh, that's how it develops. I think it's estimated that there's something in the region of four million men, women and children who are engaged in the cultivation of illicit narcotic crops. Um, and what we do know is that drug crop cultivation is actually a sign of poverty rather than a sign of wealth. Um, and it's traditionally in communities, whether it's Afghanistan, Bolivia, Colombia, Burma, which is obviously uh, Myanmar, which is a very important region for us currently with the transition. It's where we have this absence of citizenship, where we have an absence of security, that narcotic crop cultivation becomes a, a key driver of stability and livelihoods. So when you go into these communities and you destroy this crop cultivation without effective citizenship models or state uh, citizenship models being created, this has devastating effects on livelihoods and it has devastating effects on development and security. First, how it is not easy in the minds of the of the of the people who who are designing the project. The question is very easy. We substitute the coca, for example, in Bolivia, with coffee because in the global market the coffee is with the high prices. But who controls the high prices in the of the coffee? Is the New York Bourse? You know. Then is that the question? No. Till today, we didn't give the possibility for uh, the organi peasant organizations or the farmers to show us the way of develop they want. 
we show them the way develop, of develop we want. That's the problem. Some of the financing of the Taliban comes from opium uh, production, but I, they are not dependent on it. Uh, their estimates are very rough, but maybe 50 to 100 million dollars a year. So you compare to the international community spending of maybe 100 billion dollars a year in Afghanistan, it's, it's pretty tiny. And it's, uh, the, the Taliban also have other sources. Uh, and I very much object to this kind of uh, linking the Taliban to the drug industry and sort of using a way to demonize both. And the idea somehow that if you take harsh actions against drugs, you will get rid of the Taliban. No, absolutely not. Uh, certainly the dependence of the Afghan government on uh, funds from opium is higher through corruption, patronage, bribery. And so I think, that, I think you need a balanced approach. The, the money is influencing whoever is in power in Afghanistan. In some places it's the government, in some places it's the Taliban, in some places it's other strong local strongmen. And so, uh, so uh, I think it's actually better to, to keep a clear mind to separate the Taliban issues from the drug industry. And the Taliban actually would love if the international community engaged in heavy eradication or something because the farmers would be very upset and they would join the Taliban. In Colombia, you know, six million of hectares were sprayed with the glyphosate. And the, the Colombian plan will spend till this year one and a half million, a billion dollars in spraying. And we are now uh, insisting in scientific research about the consequences of the glyphosate spraying. Uh, we know uh, empirically the problems are causing the, 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 the spraying in Colombia, in the Amazonian forest, uh, with the people, with the persons, uh, animals, fauna. It is a matter of a long study and I hope sincerely that the international community will uh, punish Monsanto with, because they are, they are really criminals in this question. They are profiting with the, with the suffering of millions of people, millions of persons. Well, good luck with the prosecution of Monsanto no, there. No, I think that's, that's uh, very impossible. optimistic. I know, it's impossible. But, but I think what that also speaks to is the um, vested interests of the kind of military defence conglomerations, isn't it, which is so embedded in US foreign policy and US power. And I think the key thing really, which also goes back to what William said before, is that even if we remove the narcotics, it's not going to remove the key sources of funding for insurgents and rebel groups, and nor does it address the drivers of that insurgency or conflict in the first place. So even if we take out uh, the cocaine, even if we take out opium, what we've seen traditionally with insurgent groups is that they will find other means of funding their insurgency. So whether this is through kidnapping, whether it's through money laundering, whether it's through engagement in, in other forms of illicit economies, it simply has no net effect on our ability to reduce conflict and build more peaceful societies because we're not addressing that fundamental cause of grievance. So the big danger that we have is that we have this elision of the war on drugs and the war on terror, which is really what we've seen in places like Colombia and we've yeah. seen in Afghanistan. And this is, a, this is for, to my mind, a really catastrophic merger of security and defense and development policies, which is simply not addressing how we actually deal with these conflicts in the first place. Simply to eradicate the narcotics deals with nothing in terms of these insurgencies or how they're funded, or as I said, how we build these peaceful societies. I think it can, it can actually make things worse because the Afghans are very, uh, you know, they have a lot of communications, both informal, they have more cell phones now than a long time in history, radio, television, and they know what's going on. And they see that uh, eradication is going after farmers, but there have been some major cases of direct, of allegations and evidence, let's say, of, of higher level peoples associated with the government linked with drugs, and they are not touched. And there is actually a, a famous case where one of the Afghan airlines <coughs> was, uh, was uh, blacklisted by the US military for uh, suspected involvement in transporting drugs. And the president of Afghanistan himself got so upset about that that he prevailed on the US to, to withdraw that allegation. Uh, and so, so what it means, I think, is the farmers are the ones who don't have all the political protection and they are uh, 
uh, they are vulnerable, and if so, if you crack down on law enforcement, you get the small farmers and other small actors, and of course, you still don't touch the, the uh, larger actors who, in a country like Afghanistan, are politically very important. I think the kind of whole neoliberal economic reform agenda of the 1990s also created a wonderful mechanism for the laundering of money. Because the sale of state assets, the privatization, particularly in places like perhaps Mexico um, and in the Balkans, has actually created these wonderful opportunities for laundering cash. So there is, does seem to be a correlation between the laundering of money and neoliberal economic policy agendas. And when that's in a post-conflict context, um, then it creates a very unhealthy and unfavorable mix the second largest producer of opiates in the world after Afghanistan is a country named Australia. And Australia produces large amounts of opiates, which are entirely legal, licensed, regulated, and they go to the pharmaceutical companies. Now those opiates go into the US and are consumed, and in many cases the abuse of legal opiates is a big problem. So, so I'm saying the mix of the legal and illegal. Legal. This, this licensing opportunity for, for the poor countries. Do you think licensing would be a solution for Afghanistan? Not as long as there's an illegal market. No, I think because what Afghanistan now produces 90% of the illicit opiates, let's say about half of total opiates, uh, from only 10% of Afghanistan's land. So what would happen if you license that amount of production, they would produce, they would be happy to do that, and then they would also uh, produce a lot of illegal. Uh, it's very hard to control the leakages when you have two different markets. But my point of view is from a point of view of, of some of the corporations and things you're mentioning, something is entirely legal and leads to, art, uh, to uh, legal opiates being heavily abused in countries like the US. Lots of people use abuse painkillers and are addicted to them. And it's completely legal, and, and the farmers in Australia are treat, they're not criminalized, they're treated well. It goes all through the value chain, but the end result is a problem. And yet the Afghans, then, who produce it and also have end, uh, abuses at the end, uh, become criminalized. And I think it's a, an interesting dichotomy and suggests some of the contradictions uh, that are going here. But uh, uh, the short answer to your question is, I think, if there's a global reform, then there would be opportunities for licensing. I'm more uh, doubtful if, if the global regime doesn't change, uh, then, and for one thing, Australia would not accept Afghanistan to be a licensed producer. Just like agriculture subsidies in the EU and the US, why would they let a, somebody else come into that market? And there are these examples of success, and it's basically long-term rural development. It's not like we are saying one magic crop or one substitution. It's a comprehensive uh, rural development approach, and it will take 10 to 20 years, yeah. and it will solve the problem like it did in, largely in Thailand and some other countries, uh, but it won't affect the global. So, so countries that have a strong enough governance and you know, take on the issue, there is a way forward on the production side, but it will deal with it at the country level, not at the global level, because yeah. then it just goes to, to the, the other country that has the right conditions, which is insecurity and poor governance and deep poverty, and, and they will produce uh, opium uh, in the case of, of Afghanistan. So, so again, I think you're, you're pushed into thinking about can you make broader changes or else it will just be ro rotating among different countries. Uh, let, one quick point on the, on the transit and transfer side, this is big, a very big problem. You know, when you have anti-drug measures, they change the transit routes. Each time they change the transit routes, you leave addicts there because uh, addiction grows along the transit routes. And so if you keep imposing law enforcement, maybe you move the transit somewhere else and then you would create more addicts elsewhere and it just goes on forever and, and creates uh, uh, long-standing problems of drug use. I think the other aspect of this which is really important and just developing uh, what William said about Thailand, you know, 15, 20 years, it was the monarch, it was King Bumibol who was head of this program and that was continuity and consistency. The challenge that we have today is that the UNODC and also the development community itself with its Millennium Development Goals works to very tight timetables and schedules which are very narrow in focus and very short-termist. So you can have countries such as Laos PDR, which was actually making some progress in terms of long-term strategy for, uh, for the reduction of drug crop cultivation. 
But then suddenly Laos felt that it really had to kind of come on board with the UNODC and in regional organizations <coughs> such as the ACN. And therefore it kind of went through this very horrid process, cultivation reductions, forced eradication. So neither the development community or the current drug policy community actually looks towards the long term. Everything is in a very narrow, compressed time frame, which really is completely irrelevant and not very helpful in terms of trying to address the issue of drug crop cultivation. Thank you. I'm Peter Scherf from the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. And I have two questions, and one is about the banking system. Uh, just a few weeks after the uh, financial crisis started in 2008, Mr. Antonio Maria Costa, the head of the UN Agency on Drugs and Crime, said that uh, several banks were saved, virtually saved, by the liquid cash coming from the black market. Do you think, is it, is it true or is it an exaggeration? Uh, my second question is about Afghanistan and Russia. Uh, I, I attended the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in uh, Vienna last year, and uh, it seemed that Russia has great ambitions in Afghanistan, like Viktor Ivanov, the head of the anti-narcotic agency, made a speech, and he said that after NATO is moving out from Afghanistan, they try to take over the role of uh, US and NATO operations, and... Uh, and they have, uh, have these rainbow plans to eradicate uh, corpse in Afghanistan. So what do you think, Bill, how, how, how serious is the threat that, that Russia will play a, a greater role in Afghanistan? I hope that the Russians would have learned the lessons from their <laughs> occupation. And, so I, so, and I also question whether they have the strength of political will to do too much damage in Afghanistan. So that would be my first answer that I, I don't think, I think they're trying to bluster and they're also trying to put more pressure on others to do their dirty work. But I, I would be doubtful if, if the Russian influence in any way replaces the size of the NATO and, and the US involvement. I would say that 120 years ago, the United States used narco diplomacy um, and counter narcotics as a tool of foreign policy. And I would say that Russia is probably doing exactly the same thing today. I don't believe that drug policy has anything to do with drugs at all. I think drug policy is all to do with foreign policy and defense policy and security policy. So I'm not really surprised, uh, given Russian ambitions, that Russia is actually using the war on drugs as a new vehicle for its, uh, for its international diplomatic and perceived security efforts. Um, on banking, again, I'm, um, I'm not the most knowledgeable, but, you know, 10 years ago when I was uh, in the United States, there were scandals then about the U.S. banking system being used to launder money from Mexico. This isn't a new story, and the failures of the first world banking sector, particularly after the liberalization of the financial sector, um, to be used as a tool for money laundering is, is an old story. So I would say that the U.N. ODC is slightly delayed in that, uh, that interpretation, but of course the Western banks are fully culpable if not more so. It's, it's very convincing for us to focus on problems of cultivation when I would argue that the real problem actually lies in the, uh, the Western financial systems. It takes a focus off there if we just focus on the problems of the Afghan cultivating farmers. I was just wondering, um, I was intrigued by this uh, discussion and also by the, the, the short movie. I was just a bit uh, puzzled because I don't deny or I don't uh, question the ultimate finding that eradication was not very productive, but the argumentation was not very, let's say, scientific, because mm -hmm. obviously everything depends on the counterfactual. What would have happened without, for instance, eradication strategies? Wouldn't have the market even more <coughs> exploded, so to speak. So as I said, it's not, it, it's not necessarily questioning the finding that eradication didn't work, but uh, my question would be actually, what would be kind of uh, for policy people be a desirable kind of uh, involvement of uh, academic uh, research? Well, I think if uh, we did not eradicate, we would have more cultivation and that would bring down the cost of the end product itself. So actually eradication has the counterintuitive and counterfactual uh, impact of actually increasing the prices and therefore further incentivizing people to come into the narcotic drug market. Um, so we all, I think we already know what the counterfactuals are and we've had the counterfactuals since the end of the Second World War when really the kind of war on drugs was escalated. In terms of evidence based on where does academia come in, 
Um, I think that we already have substantial evidence um, in terms of the impacts of um, counter-narcotics activities. I think the challenge is that we don't articulate that evidence in a way that either the development community or the international diplomatic community can engage with it in a way that can actually affect policy change. If there is anywhere where I think it would be very useful to have um, further research, I think it would be in terms of longitudinal studies um, which again goes back to my point that the problem is counter-narcotics policy is very short-termist. I think we need uh, studies which look at, you know, 15, 20 years impact of what a counter-narcotics strategy actually does. We, uh, William and I were at a conference recently in Sussex where we had a colleague over from the United States who was talking about a Mexican community that he'd been working with. He showed us photographs of the children in this community 10, 15 years ago and he said, I can tell you now, these children are narco-traffickers. For example, when you look at the shifts that we've seen in public policy around, for example, in the UK where I'm from, we've just legalised gay marriage. What was it that allowed that big shift in public policy? How do you shift public policy debates which are informed by morality, which is what the drugs debate is all about? And so I think we just need to understand with what are the drivers of public policy change rather than worrying about bringing any, any more empirical evidence to the table. On Afghanistan, I think the evidence is very clear. Uh, there they didn't go in for fumigation, but they did do manual eradication. And also the most effective things they did was actually just banning poppy. And I mean, the Taliban at one point banned it all through the country. And then after the international intervention, it's been banned in certain provinces at certain times, quite effectively in the short run. But so you have these policies imposed. And over the long run, you have no real decline. It seems that the, uh, the uh, poppy cultivation and especially the production is, is determined largely by price, by, uh, by uh, yields, by weather factors and things like that. So, so last year, uh, production went down and it was because there was a cold snap in the, in the key time of the season. So I think if you looked at Afghanistan, the evidence is pretty clear that compared to er eradication and, and bans did not have uh, significant impact compared to these other factors, the weather, the price. It seems like the, the legalization, if you, if you sort of think about also sequencing policy responses, it seems like the, the first that it may have to be done is start with a major um, decriminalization uh, on the demand side and, and uh, accompany it with the harm reduction program, so legalization, legalization of drugs and on the demand side. Has anybody done some simulations and studies what the implications would be on the supply side, on the economies of the supply side, shifting away from from uh, the drug production into other areas? Has there been any studies that could demonstrate what the impact would be? I mean, there's a series of, you know, random, very, very specific studies, but I don't think there has been this kind of comprehensive pulling together of all of the information to track whether we have the same kind of generic impacts. As far as I know, that hasn't been done, but I'm happy to stand corrected if anybody knows of any universalized studies. I mean, I think the devil is in the details, and as I think uh, some of the po policy reform advocates quite explicitly recognize, this, just like nothing else, will solve all problems the whole licensing and regulation approach also won't solve all problems. And if you look at the, the abuse of legal opiates now, you can see some of the problems that come up. Uh, but, you know, I think on particular countries, uh, it would be possible, it'd be an interesting area to work. The feeling on Afghanistan would be that if it's a completely legalized and regulated regime, Afghanistan might not produce any opium, which would have some economic costs, but I would argue probably more than offset by the benefits of not having such a major criminal activity. I know criminals would get into other activities, but I don't think they could be quite so lucrative. Please uh, stay tuned for, uh, on the websites of the uh, Open Society Foundation's Global Drug Policy Program and also at the CU School of Public Policy for the next event, which I believe will happen in, in April, and then we will talk about the uh, uh, the role of the international drug control system. Uh, that's, that's actually the detail uh, we, we, we all should focus when talking about this issue. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please have a glass of wine or juice. <laughs>